Welcome, my friends, to the Bob and Brad podcast, produced by Bob and Brad, the two most famous physical therapists on the internet. I am Bob. I'm exactly one half of the Bob and Brad team. And today, my guest host is Mike Keenitz, physical therapist assistant. And Mike is going to help me interview Rick Olderman. And we're going to talk about back pain, knee and hip pain, shoulder pain, and foot and ankle pain. So stick around. Because you're going to realize everything's connected. Right. Now we're going to move on to the book titled Fixing You Hip and Knee Pain. Is it called Hip and Knee Pain? It says both. Yep. Oh, it does have both. Yep. So who in particular would benefit from this book? Uh, again, anyone with chronic hip or knee pain. <laughs> gotcha. That makes sense. Makes because, sense. because if, you have, if you're having chronic problems, again, it's not because you're broken. It's because the way people have been approaching you is from this component standpoint, which is our training as medical professionals to look at things, oh, you've got a knee pain, so I'm gonna solve everything in the knee. But what about the foot and the hip, right? So uh, what about the back? You know, all sorts of things. So uh, what about how they're walking? What about how you're sitting? What about how you're standing? What about how you're exercising? Once you understand things from a system standpoint, all of those other questions make sense. And this is what I believe is missing in physical therapy is that we're going more towards manipulations to solve a component problem. Right. But I, I believe we're getting away from truly how the body works in this way. We're relying on something passive to solve pain. And if, if, you're, if you're listening out there and you have some idea that says, that, and you believe that, oh yeah, I, I bet how I'm using my body has something to do with my pain, then this systems approach is your solution sure. because it's all about how you're using your body, right? So, uh, yeah. So that's who would benefit. <laughs> Sounds good. So in the book, you say there are three common problems that happen with hip and knee pain. You talk about poor performance, tight muscles, and poor movement habits. Would you mind elaborating on each of those? Yes. Yeah. So uh, I'm going to... I may geek out just a little bit here, but stick sure. with me. Uh, I'll try not to. So here's the thigh bone, all right? It starts at the, at the pelvic, at the hip joint here, and it, it goes to the knee, knee joint. So the thigh bone is half of the knee joint. If we don't pay attention to how this thing is controlled, then we're missing half of the control of the knee joint. There's precious little in the knee joint that's actually controlling the knee joint muscularly, okay? Yeah. So the big players up in the pelvis and the hip are the butt muscles, the gluteus maximus and the gluteus medius. The gluteus maximus is that big bulbous butt muscle, the bigger one that you see in, in you know, especially runners have big butts, right? right? And so that thing has many different functions. It's like, I describe it like a hand muscle. It's a hand muscle that has lots of different uses and it controls this thigh bone in particular ways. So making sure that thing is working properly is critical to controlling how the thigh bone is, is corrected. Now, the gluteus medius is smaller. It has a more precise type of function for the hip. And so that has a lesser role in controlling the femur, but it does, okay? So that's the upper half of the knee, gotcha. you can, is, which is controlled from the, from the hip and pelvis. And so the glutes are the big powerhouses. Those are the movers and shakers of, the, uh, of controlling this. But you can do all the strengthening in the world, and if you're not walking correctly to use the glutes, because that's their whole purpose, is to help us walk. If you're not changing how you're walking to turn on the butt muscles, then all the strengthening or stretching or whatever you're doing is gonna be for naught, because you're not applying it to how you're using your body. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Yeah. And, 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 and gait is the biggest thing. I mean, you know, it's the thing that we do most of. And if we're not walking correctly, then that is actually turning off these muscles. All right? You could do a thousand lunges, squats, deadlifts, whatever you want to do. But if you're not walking and using it, what's the purpose? It's not doing anything. So, so that's the upper half of the knee joint. 
The lower half is then controlled by the foot, calf, and soleus muscles. So if you have, and, and the calf muscles uh, attach above the knee joint here, okay? So if your calf muscles are, usually the problem with calves are, are that they're too tight. And so what they're doing is pulling the knee back into a locked position. Uh, and they're not allowing the ankle to move the way it should move. And so you have to solve the calf and soleus tightness and function issue for the other half of the knee joint. Now, the, the third thing, there's only one muscle in the knee that controls the knee joint, the popliteus muscle. And that wow. runs from the inside of the knee to the, to the outside, like this, okay? And it crosses the knee joint in a diagonal. Well, if you look at the architecture of the way the knee is built, you see how one uh, lobe is angled differently than the other. So rotation is built into the knee joint, all right? It rotates with all movement. The popliteus, because it runs from the inside to the outside and crosses the knee joint, helps control that rotation. So when you have knee pain, what is often happening is that the popliteus is in spasm and it's locking the knee into the, the rotated position. And so by simply massaging the popliteus muscle, it unlocks the knee and almost all knee pain will go away almost immediately. I had a, a woman come in with a tibial plateau fracture, which is a fracture of the top of the right. lower leg bone here. She came in with a tibial plateau fracture in incredible pain. All I did was massage her popliteus. She walked out with probably 95% less pain. I didn't change the fracture. I changed the stresses that were acting on the fracture. And that's what a systems approach does to think for, think, for the is body. Is that uh, popliteus painful? Oh, yeah. It'll be painful because, oh. A, it's a, t it's a tiny, deep muscle. Right. All right? So when you massage it, you can't attack. <laughs> You've got to be gentle right. and kind of sneak your way in and give it okay. some love instead of attacking it, right? Because uh, people will jump off your table. Uh, sure. when you touch this thing. And you'll find any, any of you out there who have knee pain or practitioners listening who are treating people with stubborn knee pain, even post-surgical, especially post-surgical. I had a guy who had a, a ACL, a whole reconstruction of his knee, meniscus, ACL, everything, and he could not uh, straighten or bend his knee. He was in so much pain after surgery. All I did our first session was massage his popliteus muscle he gained 20 degrees of knee flexion right wow. there and went into full knee extension. And it's because that little tiny muscle is locking the knee into a rotated position and causing all sorts of havoc in there. But again, the question has to be, but why is the popliteus in spasm? That's where the gait pattern comes in. That's where the calf, soleus, and hip muscles come in because things aren't working here correctly. And that's why this little guy is doing too much and go, going into spasm. Sure. This is fascinating. So if poor walking mechanics is the major cause of your glute max not firing properly, what do you recommend the people to fix their gait? I know we've looked into more like minimal or less supportive shoes to help with that, but what's your opinion on it? Yeah, uh, uh, shoe, you know, orthotics and shoe wear are the last things I look at. So really... Uh, the, the big problem that almost everyone is running into, no pun intended, uh, <laughs> with gait issues is that uh, their knees are locking, all right? And what is happening is that because our shoe wear typically has a thick sole, especially the heel portion, you look at your shoes, you'll see the heel portion is super thick, right? right? Absolutely. Well, well that, allows us, that allows us to strike that heel stronger than we would naturally do that. And what that does is it allows us to put that foot further out in front of us than it needs to be because we can hit that heel as hard as we possibly want to because we have all that padding right there. If you just compare how you walk without your shoes on to how mm. you walk with your shoes on, you'll notice that you walk slightly differently. And it's because you can't get away with striking that heel so hard when you're walking without those shoes on. That is closer to how you should be walking. 
And what you'll, the biggest difference that you'll see there is that when you're walking without your shoes on, you'll notice that your knee unlocks, it is more prone to unlock. With your shoes on, your knee is more prone to lock. Makes sense. And that's what's turning off the butt muscles. That's what's spasming the popliteus muscle. So how do you get the glute muscles to fire? Yeah, so that, that takes a little bit of uh, guidance on my part. Uh, but uh, in my programs, I teach people how to do this. So the, the, the simplest way is, so, well, first of all, you have to prove to yourself that your glutes aren't working. Right. So the test I would give to your listeners is, is this. Put your fingers on your butt muscles. Pinch them together, and you'll feel that there's your maximum contraction. All right? And you should feel it nice and firm and hard when you pinch them together like that. Keep your fingers there. Now relax completely your butt muscles, and they should feel flabby again. Now keep your fingers on both butt muscles while you walk you know, five or ten steps, and you'll notice, gosh, they're not really firing, right? Yeah. That's your test to say, to show you that the butt is not working when you're walking, which is when it's needed the most. I don't know, have you guys ever, uh, like, turned around and immediately run into a doorway or a table or something like that that you didn't realize was right there? Sure. Uh, I do that periodically. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, what always amazes me is, the amount of force that my body has generated with just a half of a step. Sure. Just a half step, and it's like I just got hit by a linebacker, right? And so that glute is helping control all of that force that you're generating in your walking. And so if it is not turning on with walking, all that force is being translated into smaller tissues and joints, and that's where the breakdown is happening. So to solve that, an easy way would be uh, to, if you get up on your tippy toes and you keep your hands on your butt muscles and you walk around on your tippy toes, you'll notice that you start to feel some contraction in your butt muscle naturally. Good. You should never turn on your butt, con you should never turn it on consciously because what happens when you see a squirrel? Then your butt turns off. What we want to do is fix your walking pattern so it never turns off. No matter if you're seeing a squirrel running from a car or whatever you're noticing during your walk, if you fix your walk, you can think about all sorts of other things other than contracting your butt. So if you walk around on your tippy toes, you'll notice that your butt now is starting to turn on. Why? Because you'll notice that your body is aligned differently over your foot at foot strike when you're doing this. And so what you do is you slowly lower your heels back down to introduce the heels back into striking, and you'll notice that your butt continues to turn on. Oh, that's And great the reason advice. it's turning on, that the, re the reason it's continuing to turn on is because it's, it's sticking with that new gait pattern that you just taught it with the tiptoe walking. It's not so much the foot strike pattern. It's about your whole body moving over the foot at foot strike. Gotcha. So in your book, you also talk about the big time hip flexors, in your opinion, are the tensor fasciolata, the sartorius, and the rectus femoris. Why do you say those versus like what Bob and I probably learned in school was your iliopsoas? Well, one of the things is because whenever I focus on the iliopsoas, I never saw results in my patients. Sure. Right? That makes sense. Uh, and, so, and so look at the lever arm. Look at the lever arm of the sartorius, the rectus, and the tensor fasciolata. Huge lever arms acting on the, on, to flex that hip, right? Enormous muscles, huge bulk. Look at the iliopsoas. It's just wow. barely crossing the yep. hip joint, yep. and, it, and it's tiny, and, it, and it's very close to the hip joint itself. Look at the, the, all those other muscles by virtue of the fact that they start at the ASIS on the pelvis, are much further away from the joint. So they have tremendous hip flexion leverage to flex that hip. The iliopsoas is just a helper. The problem is in the big guys, not that little tiny guy. That little tiny guy may be irritated, but it may be irritated for different reasons than, and that irritation may not directly be impacting the whatever you're trying to solve by addressing the, the psoas. Well, I was gonna say, a lot of this 
approach to understanding how we work, work as a system involves rethinking the, uh, the significance of our anatomy. It's not enough to know that the iliopsoas starts at your, you know, L1 through 5 and then inserts into the top of the hip bone. Right. And it's not enough to know that we have these other hip flexors here. You have to understand the meaning and the significance of the architecture of our bodies. And that's what I've been rethinking for these last 20 years, and that's how I've put all this stuff together. Right? Okay. You know all of these things, all of this anatomical stuff. You know this. But we're taught to think about it in a different way than what it could be more useful in our clinical experience. Do you even want me to ask this last question? No, that's, that's fine. <laughs> I th think uh, we'll switch subjects. <laughs> well, it's like was, one exercise okay. for knee pain, but we realize it's a whole systematic thing. Yeah, so. It's, <laughs> it's right. a whole system. And ultimately, I'll tell you, no one gets out of our clinic. If you have come in with back, sciatic, SI, hip, pelvic, uh, knee, foot, no one, no one gets, I'm sorry, can you guys hear that? Dinging. Yep. I'm sorry, sorry no, about that. No. Uh, okay. I'll, I'll, but, but no one comes, no one leaves our clinic with any of those diagnoses without learning how to walk again better. Because walking is where it all, that's where the rubber hits the road. That's how we're supposed to be using our bodies. If you, so ultimately, whatever you do, you have to fix your walking pattern or else it will keep breaking down your body. I'm a, I'm a big believer. I, I had um, hamstring problems and um, anterior hip pain, and all went away with uh, adjusting my walking.